very much. Welcome in the studio. Welcome at home. It's time once again to look who's talking. And our guest today was thrown out of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and told not to even consider a career in acting or in entertainment. Well, just to prove how wrong they all were, he went on to become a star on stage and radio, television and films. We know him and love him best for his parts as Doctor Who and Wurzel Gummidge. Would you welcome, please, Mr. John Pertwee? John! Hey, lovely to see you. Welcome. I had difficulty in getting through all that because you you were made an appearance, and I could see all these lovely ladies going buzz, 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 buzz. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. Looking I'm, elegant and I don't well. feel as well as you look. No, I had a little holiday and he put on a lot work of weight. Enough, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he spends far too much time with it, Tenerife or something. That's it. Mm. Good areas, yeah. John, could I ask you first about the name, a fascinating name, Pertwee? I looked through our local yes. phone book. I can't find any. You won't. No, there's only well, there's only one family of us really, but the name originates from a. A French name. We're a French family. My real name is Jean de Pertuis de Laïevaux. That's good. Oh, 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 that. oh, oh, oh. Jean de Pertuis de Laïevaux. We're, we're a French family. We come from near Aix-en-Provence. There's a little place called Pertuis. Uh, Pertuis means a cleft in a mountain. So if you say, where's the clock tower? You said you, you can see it through vers the Pertuis, through the little cleft in the mountain top. Mm. And that's what my name means. And there's a village which is called Petri, and that's where we come from. Are there many of you around in, in, in Britain? In this country, yes. Well, we, the, the family escaped out of France in the Huguenotic purge. And uh, they, they, most of them settled in Essex. And there are a lot of Pertries in Essex which are uh, in the flower business, in F-L-O-U-R and F-L-O-W-E-R. That's nice. And my, well, my, my own immediate family, of course, are all in the theatre. There you are. And people didn't know this was an educational program, you see, did yeah, they? Yeah, yes. <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised what you're going to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Stop me a lesson. Or two, well, let's stay with the family, John, because mm -hmm. you were born into a theatre family, were you not? Yes. My father is, is Roland Pertwee, who is an eminent playwright in his day, and he used to write in uh, the Strand magazine. I expect some of you mm -hmm. must remember the Strand magazine, and Colliers and Blackwoods and the Saturday Evening Post in America. He wrote short stories. He started as a painter. He was a painter, a Royal Academician painter. And then he became an actor. And then in the First World War, he became a writer. And then from a writer, he went to, he gave up being an actor. Quite rightly so, he was a dreadful actor. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was appearing, there's a film on, some of you may have seen, the other day called The Four Just Men, in which I made yes. my very first appearance in, and I have a very tiny part in it. And he was billed. Roland Pertwee was billed appearing in it, and he was dreadful. He only had one line. I was much better. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, other members of the family are quite well known. Brother Michael. My brother Michael is an eminent playwright, too, and a scenarist. He and my father collaborated on the first soap opera in this country called The Grove Family. Yes. Uh, remember yes. The Grove oh, family? we all remember The Grove, yes. don't we? Yes. And uh, yes. they collaborated with that. And then my, my father had uh, written many successful plays. He wrote a play called Interference, which was Sir Gerald de Maurier starred in for a long time in London. And my father took over from that and eventually played it when Sir Gerald mm. left. And he wrote the first play ever that uh, Dame Edith Evans had a starring role in. And uh, uh, he then went on to being a, a scenarist and went to Hollywood and was in Hollywood for many years. And of course, Cousin Bill is, is also well known around. Yes, it? indeed. Yes. Yes, C Cousin Bill was, started in the theatre with me as a schlapper when I was going around as a vaudeville c comic when I was working in music halls. And Bill came and learned the trade with me. Yeah. I used to have a roll of newspaper which I kept in a sock. And I kept it on my dressing room table. And I used to send him out when he got me ready. And I said, no, go and look at the acts. And he used to come back and report on what the acts were like. And I'd say, well, what was some sudden sort of person like? He said, oh, he was marvelous. He was, so I then hit him all around the room with his <laughs> and said, if, as long as you think he's funny, you will never be a star. <laughs> what was the childhood like then in, in, in that sort of family? Mine? Yes. Not very good. Not why? Uh, well, my father was a very, uh, uh, how can I put this? He, well, he wasn't, he wasn't particularly fond of having kids around, and he had his own life to live. And um, I, the, he and my mother separated when I was a, a baby. My mother took one look at me as a child and went, you know, and then. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so my brother and I were brought up by my granny, who was a lovely lady called Emily, and she was an, an, an ex-opera singer. She was a member of a group of extraordinary sisters called the Moore family. And there was Eva Moore, Dame Eva Moore, who was a great actress in her day. And her daughter was Jill Esmond, and she married Laurence Olivier, who's his first mm. wife. And uh, Decima was a, a Savoyard, sang in the Gilbert and Sullivan operas. 
and my grandmother was an opera singer and so on, right through all, all the sisters. Yes. Now, did you ever see a play called Pink String and Sealing Wax? Yes, I did. Well, my father wrote that, and that was all about yeah. my aunts. They, in fact, remember when they broke open the money yes. boxes in order to get <laughs> yes. enough money for my grandmother to go to London to be tested as a, as a singer by Adelina Patti. So having That's shaken true. off all this, this, this notable family, how did you make a start in the business? I mean, well, I mentioned Rada. I mean, was that an early step for you? Uh, well, yeah, it was an, uh, yes, it was an early step backwards. You see. <laughs> uh, I was thrown out of most things as a youngster. I was thrown out of nearly every school I went to. The first school I went to, I, I swung on a lavatory chain impersonating Tarzan. <laughs> <laughs> I made two, two chains and fell into the bowl on the third. <laughs> Flushed with success, yes. right? <laughs> No, no. <laughs> and so I was duly expelled for that, and then I went to another school, which I managed to get through, and then I was expelled from Sherbourne, and I, my public school, I hated that. And so it was alternate ones I stayed mm. and was expelled mm. from, and I finished up at RADA, and I didn't last very long there either. I was, they asked you to leave? I was superannuated, yes. Yeah. They said I had no future in the theatre whatsoever. What, what brought them to that conclusion, John? Well, they said that I'd written rude things on the lavatory walls about the principal. It was, it was quite, quite untrue. I hadn't at all, I assure you. My father was very incensed by this, and having had my word that I didn't do it, said that he would get Sir Patrick Hastings, the great KC at that time, uh, to defend me and the best graphologist in the world, because he was very incensed by it. Uh, so Sir Kenneth Barnes rather sort of backed down a bit on this, although he did produce a whole collection of actors in his office, uh, which said I would be judged by my betters and my peers. And I took one look at them. They all looked as if they were sitting waiting for death. <laughs> and I, I didn't, want, didn't want to join them. So I, I just walked out and left them. And they felt frightfully silly all sitting there. But you didn't, remember that. you didn't give up the, 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 the business, theater. obviously. I mean, it wasn't a no, 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 deterrent. No, I, I, I pursued it. I didn't, the reason why I was thrown out was I didn't want to be a wind. Pardon? I didn't want to be a wind. They, they, were, they did Greek plays. And I, I was supposed to sort of sit in the corner of the stage and go, ooh. <laughs> And I thought that was sort of futile thing to be a wind and pay whatever it was, you know, two hundred and fifty pound a term. So I objected to that, and he he objected to my objecting. But I was very lucky because that year, at the end of that year, when I was due to leave, a Noah Card came to see the play, and I was doing two parts in this public production. Uh, the first part I played a man uh, who was murdered at the, at, in the beginning of the first act, and then in the last act I played the detective who found out who murdered him. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, had a, I was very heavily made up in each occasion. And uh, after the show, uh, Kenneth Barnes said to Noel Card, what, what, was there anything that you sort of particularly liked? Was there anybody that turned any sort of talent at all? And he said, yes, I thought there were two very, very, very um, splendid young actors. Who, uh, I particularly liked the young fellow who was murdered in the first act and a remarkably good performance by the detective who found out who murdered him in the last. <laughs> what, he said, uh, who were their names? What were their names? And Kenneth Barnes said, I said, I beg your pardon? So they were sort of the same, same man, actually. <laughs> so I was very chuffed about that. <laughs> and you, you went on the road after that? Then I went on the road. I was in the Arts League of Service Travelling Theatre, which some of you may remember. It used to tour around this part of the world. It was a fit-up company. We went to uh, different places every night, sometimes in little the halls that were no bigger than the studio. And uh, sometimes there were big town halls, and we had a, a proscenium arch which could uh, be widened or shortened and, and entirely depending on what was necessary mm -hmm. to the size. And we had 150 items of things where we did uh, sea shanties and ballet and classic mime and one-act plays and, and uh, extracts from the bard. They had to choose at least one extract from the bard. And we would do these uh, in a different show every night. Weren't you involved in circus too? Am I right? I read Yes, somewhere. I was hoping you didn't remember that. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, r I rode on a thing called the Wall of Death. Uh, which is a thing like a cup. It was a big wooden cup and you ride motorcycles round and round it. I had a good idea. I thought that was rather silly riding motorbikes round and round it. I thought it was a bit boring that everybody had seen that. So we d developed an old baby Austin with a flat platform and we, we bought a very old lion. It hadn't got any teeth. It was so old. So we, we, we strapped its mouth together so it wouldn't go <laughs> and show that it wasn't a very frightening lion. And we, we sat that on the back and drove the lion round the wall of death. It was very original. And I worked in the circus for Billy Smart Circus because David Smart was a great friend of mine and did all the... You must have found this sort of background shows. varied and interesting, uh, invaluable sort of now, I mean, in, in terms of, of the later... Oh, tremendously. All... Yeah character forming and, and very it's and also for yes for, for not character forming so much as, as le learning characters from mm. 
that sort of experience. I want to talk to you about some of the marvelous characters you've created, but I think, first of all, we'll, have a, we'll let you take a little break and perhaps we can practice the wall of death around the studio. We'll be back <laughs> in a couple of minutes with more from our guest, Mr. John Pertwee. John. Welcome back to Look Who's Talking, our guest, Mr. John Pertwee. John, we've covered the, the sort of early career, at least we've scratched around among it all, but let's move on to the sort of better-known career. Now, when was the first real break? My first break came when I was in the Navy. I, I'd been... Uh, I was working for the Naval Broadcasting Section, and I was sent along to the Criterion Theatre in the West End to check up on a Lieutenant Eric Barker, who was doing a radio series called... Uh, uh, I think it was called Mediterranean Merry-Go-Round. And he was being very rude about my lords at the Admiralty and, and being satirical about them. They said, go along and find out what he's talking about. So I went and sat in the back of the auditorium, and he shouted for uh, a, a young officer called John Nelson Burton, who eventually became a famous television director, uh, to shout out something from the audience. And he wasn't there. So I said, well, I'll do it. And he said, who are you? And I said, I'm a spy. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he looked at me, and he said, well, what's your name? And I said, Pertwee. And he said, it's a familiar name. And I, and I said, yeah, well, maybe. I said, can I do the job? I'll do shout out the line. And he said, well, yes, all right, what's the deal? And I said, well, I won't send in a bad report about you if you let me do the part. <laughs> and so the line I had to shout, he was talking to Pearl Hackney, his wife, and they were arguing. And I leapt to my feet and said, why don't you leave him alone? You're always picking on the poor perisher. <laughs> and to which Eric stops and looks into the auditorium, and, and, and Pearl Hackney said to him, who nursed that? And he said, oh, that's the Minister of Education. <laughs> uh, the Minister of Education at that particular time had rather a strong Cockney accent. <laughs> And this was exactly the type of joke that I was sent down to stop. But, of course, I didn't stop it. And I then was with Eric Barker for years and years and years. That was my breakthrough into, uh, into radio. Name, and, name some of those fabulous series. I mean, we still hear well, this was Well, this was Mediterranean Merry-Go-Round with a double or quits cash quiz, and then it became Waterlogged Spa, yes. which we ran for many years, where I played the postman, you know. Oh, tear him up, my dear. And what does it matter what you do, as long as you tear him up? <laughs> and command the high price, hush, keep it dark, and... <laughs> I was a voice man, you're a multi-voice man. And um, then I joined Jimmy Jewell and Ben Warris in Up the Pole, uh, which was, went for years, as you know. Mm. And then I had my own show called Puffney Post Office. And uh, uh, Round the Bend, uh, on radio and on, eventually on television. So for many, and then the Navy Lark, which of course ran for 19 right. years, so that kept me busy on we radio. We still keep hearing that, don't we? It yes, it's still playing. Round and round. Yeah. Yes, it's still Talking playing. about the voices, and they, they were marvellous, how did you sort of set them up? I mean, how do you, how do you evolve well, one all, of your voices? Well, they're all based on real characters. In fact, they, when I was at school at Sherburn, uh, we, there was a lady who ran the tuck shop in Sherburn, and, and she used, every boy used to go there at, at, at half past ten for a, a drink and a bun. And uh, you said, uh, one long bun, one short bun, and a bottle of there, please, Mrs. Thompson, and she used to say, being the polite lady she was, she'd have a go at the name, but she didn't want to know what it was. She used to say, oh, thank you very much, Mr. Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruffin-Ruff
visualize, even for radio, do, do you visualize a character before you try and work on the voice? Or do you no, just, just, just settle for just a voice? Just put the voice to it and let the people, everybody has a different idea of what the, uh, the uh, mm. characters look like. Mm. I just wonder whether you did. No, no. You saw him as a no, short, no. stocky No, no, just vocally, no. do the vocally, yeah. let them do it. And then, of course, television began. Films, too, and, and stage. You were still doing all of Yes, I was doing a lot of, lot of movies in those days, because I had, by this time, gone into music hall, because a lot of the radio artists couldn't, in fact, make that transition but from, from radio to the theatre easily. I could, because I'd been an actor, of course, before. Mm. So it wasn't difficult, but great uh, uh, radio performers like Eric Barker found the stage a difficult medium, as did Richard Murdoch. Yes. But they didn't find the filming technique difficult and Richard is a wonderfully good yes. character actor and Eric if he hadn't had this terrible stroke many years ago about 15 years ago now he had this stroke which knocked him out of the business unfortunately mm. but he was uh, developing as a one of our finest character actors in films and there was a time when he couldn't write his name he couldn't get into pictures at all. Mm. Uh, you, you did a lot of West End theatre. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Things like Irene. Well, that was, that was, of course, much, much later on in my yes. career. I, I but that came was a long run again, wasn't when it? The vaudeville, the, when the vaudeville business went out the window, I, I then uh, worked all around the world in cabaret, um, uh, which was a conversion of my act. What bit, sort of thing did you do in, in cabaret, John? What uh, I played the guitar, satirize, sing uh, satires on folk songs, tell stories in dialect, and uh, uh, it's a, a general entertainer. Yes. I was an entertainer yes. more, than a, yes. more than a comic. Yes. You say dialect. Did you, have you mastered several, or is it your own... No, I, 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 I could speak to. most dialects and tell yes. most uh, Irish stories, Scots stories, Welsh stories and so on, you know, the standards. Yes. And I would always try to, to cover the lot, cover the mm. country in, in, in one spell. What about television? When did that start for you? Television started when television started. Uh, uh, <laughs> you were there at the time. David Jacobs and I did a series called The Amazing Adventures of Commander High Price. The only amazing thing about it was that we were allowed, allowed on the air for more than two minutes. <laughs> it was appallingly bad. <laughs> and we worked under dreadful conditions with thousands of red-hot lights hanging over mm. us, you know, a whole wall of lights. This is nothing. You'd have 150 lights like mm. this to light you. There was very difficult conditions. So well, that was the beginning of, uh, of television. Yes. And then I had a series of my own that I was pushed into doing, which I didn't want to do. And uh, I made a disastrous uh, entrance into television mm. with that, and therefore made a very hurried exit. How did you face up to the prospect of becoming Doctor Who, which really was a milestone, wasn't it, for you? Yes, it was. I wanted to do something which would uh, take me into every home, which I hadn't done up till then, I'd, uh, not, a, not as a mass medium. I'd been making a lot of pictures, a lot of movies, and uh, I worked a lot in the music halls, but that wasn't taking me actually into the home, and so I... This was the, my great opportunity of being able to do so. Mm. So I jumped at it. So uh, w were you left to create a new Doctor Who, or were you... Were no, you I was left to do it entirely my own yeah, way. So Actually, it was interesting, because Sean Sutton, who was the head of uh, the Light Entertainment... Uh, of, uh, no, what was the head of drama then? Um, he said that, uh, well, I know exactly how I want you to play it. And I said, well, I don't. Tell me. Because I don't know who... John Pertwee is, and he kept saying, I want John Pertwee to play it as John Pertwee. Mm. And I said, well, who's John Pertwee? I didn't know. I've, I've never been me. I'd always been hiding under a green umbrella, like my late friend Peter that's, Yeah, that's the thing a lot of people don't realize. No, with, with, with people who are, who are actors or trained as actors, they really don't have a persona themselves. No. They, they are whoever they were last or that's next. That's right. Yes. Well, per se, Peter was the great classic example of that. And Peter never played himself ever. I did in Doctor Who, but that was me, more or less, and I, uh, and I also played myself in a play called There's a Girl in My Soup. That was the first time I'd ever really... Well, the, even then, I covered myself with glasses, uh, mm. something to hide mm. behind. Mm. What was the effect on your, on your life of Doctor Who? I mean, it, it, as you say, you suddenly became everyone's property into every home nationally, internationally known. Yes. I mean, did it change anything very much for you in terms of uh, your yes. lifestyle or your life? I was life? able to have a much nicer house. <laughs> Yes, financially, of course, it was very rewarding. And not so much from, the, from what you earned from the show, because it was being children's time and uh, being mm. combination of that But it is an enormous BBC, cult it, situation. I mean, I know recently you've been to America. Well, it's, well, it's only recently become a cult. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, in the last sort of ten years, it's it really taken off. In America, it's immensely popular now. I was in America three times last year for conventions, mm. of which they have 6,000 fans a day will turn up for a three-day. Mm. A convention. Mm. It's quite remarkable. Have you a, a favourite Doctor Who story? I mean, either of making the series or... Um, well, there were so many, really. Over five years, you know, I made over 270 programmes. Uh, there was one interesting moment when uh, we were uh, in the early hours of the morning shooting in a gravel pit on, in Rygate, which was the nearest thing to a sort of moonscape that we could think of. 
And there was a draconian, an actor, who was uh, very knowledgeable about the stars and out of space. And he was in this extraordinary makeup of this little coxcomb and, and warts all over his face, weird. And uh, we were sitting on a rock in the, as dawn was breaking and he was talking to us about life in other planets and uh, about astrology and so on. And I found myself completely transported by what this man was saying and I w firmly believed that he in fact was a, a, a visitor from outer space. And when somebody suddenly turned up and said, uh, Rock, bacon rolls are up. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> yeah. It was suddenly brought down to earth with yeah. a terrible jolt and I nearly passed out. I mean, it really was a dreadful shock and I had really been ten minutes completely gone. I was yes. quite convinced from the situation and the area where we were that I wasn't in this world. Yeah. <laughs> and following Doctor Who, we had the lovely Wurzel Gummidge. Didn't yes. There is. Yeah. I mean, we, I, I detected in, in some of the earlier voices a trace of Wurzel. A trace, that's it. That's it. <laughs> it is. Yes, you... Wurzel, Wurzel is, in fact, a spin-off of The Postman, yes. I'd always wanted to find a character that, uh, that uh, would fit. I made two movies playing The Postman, in fact, uh, uh, one called... Um, uh, well, I can't remember the name of it. But I made <laughs> one movie with Michael Rennie, where I played The Postman, with that voice. And uh, I've been looking ever since to find something that I could pin it to on television. And then Keith Waterhouse and Willis Hall and uh, Gareth Wigan, the film producer, we're making a movie of Wurzel Gummidge, which is a classic story. You know, it was written mm. in the 30s by Barbara Euf and Todd as a children's classic. And uh, they, they were making a movie of it and asked me to play Mr. Gummidge, uh, being a sort of tall, decadent, string bean type of fellow. <laughs> and uh, so I said, yes, I'd love to, but they couldn't get the money together to make it, and the, the distribution wasn't forthcoming. And so they began to forget about it, and they said, well, it's just bad luck. And I said, no, don't do that. Write me a pilot and I'll sell it to television. And after a long struggle, I was able to do so. Southern, in fact, mm. bought it, and mm. we, we ran it, we presented it. It took us three years to get it on the air. And uh, after four weeks, we were somewhat of a cult. Mm. And then the figures built up to uh, 10 and 11 million people watching yes. it at 5.15 on a Saturday. Did you enjoy it, John? Did you enjoy doing it? That is the, the, the yes. If I never do anything else, I, I'd be happy. Mm. That's the actor's dream role. You looked as if you... Because it's such an old <laughs> horror. Isn't it? uh, you know, you run the gamut of all emotions, from A to Z. You, you know, you're b b b charming and nice one minute, and then absolutely beastly the next. And then you're <laughs> weeping and crying, and then you're laughing, and then you're cantankerous. I mean, you run the lot, because he's got no brains up there. It's only straw. Yes. <laughs> I should... and, and his lady love is, is the, probably the most bitchy woman that ever lived. <laughs> Aunt Sally, yes. and uh, they, people absolutely loved her. I really yeah. should have asked you when you came in today, which head are you wearing today? Is it your, your thinking I'm, head? I'm wearing me answer man today. Your answer man. <laughs> and you're busy writing a book briefly in our closing second, sir. Are oh, um, we finished already? We, we're very nearly. Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry to say. Not so quickly. I'm writing my autobiography at the and moment. And when yes. might we expect to see that? At Christmas. Oh, great. It's, great. It, it's published by uh, Hamish Hamilton, and it will be called Moon Boots and Dinner Suits. Right. Will you make us a public promise? You'll come back on, and, and, and tell us all about it on another program. You bet yeah. your life. Absolutely. A pleasure to see you. Thank you very Keep much. Keep up the good work. Lovely to see, see you. Will you say thank you to Mr. Bye. John Perkins? Yeah. Next week, Derek Beatty's guest will be the actor and comedian Jimmy Jewell. That's in Look Who's Talking next Friday afternoon. Don't forget, at 2 o'clock.